This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Jesus and the disciples went on and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. Jesus sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a child and put it among them. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Who is wise and understanding among you? Asks our epistle lesson from James this morning. Who is wise and understanding among you? What a timely question. True wisdom seems in woefully short supply these days, doesn't it? Perhaps it has always been so, I don't know. But still, our times seem acutely desperate for wise people, wise leaders. Here is just one simple index of this, which I learned from my days as chaplain at Harvard. In the 1900s, Harvard's commencement speakers included statesmen like Winston Churchill, John Kennedy and General George Marshall, brilliant writers like Carl Sandburg, Thornton Wilder, and Ralph Ellison, and prophetic voices like Mother Teresa, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and Alexander Solzhenitsyn. In the beginning years of this century, the list of Harvard commencement speakers included Mark Zuckerberg, Steven Spielberg, Oprah Winfrey, Michael Bloomberg, Tom Hanks, and Bill Gates. You'll notice something about these two lists. The list from the last century includes men and women of vast experience, courage, imagination, faith, and dare I say, wisdom. The more recent list consists of folks whose primary distinction is either making a lot of money or achieving a measure of celebrity, or both. These more recent speakers are fine people, don't get me wrong, but let's just say Mark Zuckerberg is no Winston Churchill, and Tom Hanks is no Mother Teresa. I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that at least one major reason we have so few wise leaders today is that we are increasingly a generation of people who are centered more on self than God, and who are likewise biblically illiterate, unchurched, and untethered to spiritual traditions and practices. Which is why it may be worthwhile to spend a little time this morning talking about the wisdom literature in the Bible of which the letter of James is but one fine example. Now, for most of us, I suspect, when we think about the Bible and wisdom, we think of the stories about King Solomon we learned in Sunday school. You remember those, right? At least at the beginning of his reign, Solomon appreciated that it isn't enough for a king to be merely powerful. Effective leadership requires more. It requires wisdom. So, the story goes from the third chapter of 1 Kings, when he was asked in a dream by God the one thing that he might have, 
Above all other things, Solomon asked for wisdom. The underlying Hebrew word here for wisdom is even more nuanced. It could just as easily be translated as God-listening heart. The scriptural understanding of wisdom from the Hebrew tradition includes both head and heart, and most importantly, it is centered in God. Now, poor King Solomon may have gotten off to a promising start in his reign as king, but if you know your Bible, you know that it didn't last for very long. His wisdom was ultimately overtaken by his love for money, his love for many foreign wives, and his love for power, all of which combined to turn his heart away from God, ultimately costing him and his son much of his kingdom and dividing Israel for centuries to come. It is a classic fall from grace story. What we learn from Solomon is that while human wisdom is a great gift and ought to be assiduously cultivated, purely human wisdom is inevitably limited and frail, especially when it becomes unmoored from a deep relationship with God. One of my favorite Anglican theologians is a gentleman by the name of David Ford, who teaches theology at the University of Cambridge in England. One of Ford's major interests is helping us to recover the great wisdom tradition from our Bible so that we can apply it to our everyday lives. Ford sees Christian less as an intellectual pursuit than as the cultivation of habits of heart and mind that help us to cope and thrive in the face of all of those things that we find overwhelming about human experience. Ford's most basic point is that for Christians, wisdom comes not in claiming to be wise ourselves, but in grounding ourselves in Christ's wisdom. The wonderfully paradoxical truth of the gospel is that the road to enduring wisdom does not start with our efforts, with our striving, with our designs for ourselves. For the Christian, Wisdom begins in letting ourselves go so that we can be embraced by God in Christ through the power of the Spirit. Once we are grounded in a Christ-centered life of worship, prayer, and sacrament, the pursuit of true wisdom becomes possible. It would be folly to suggest that there is any one path to wisdom, but Ford suggests at least four time-honored practices for growing in wisdom. The first is what we are doing now, to become reacquainted with the wisdom literature in the Bible. Our scripture's wisdom tradition is generally said to reside in the books of Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Songs, and the Psalms. But wisdom sayings and stories also run through the Gospels and in epistles such as the letter of James. These books contain gems of insight that seek to distill what has been learned from millennia of experience and reflection. Ford's second suggestion is to practice cultivating the traditional virtues of Christian living. St. Paul's list of the nine fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 is perhaps the most famous summary of these virtues. But our epistle lesson today also gives us a beautiful summary when James writes that the wisdom from above is, quote, pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy, much like that woman in line at Crosby's who let me go ahead of her. Ford's third recommendation is to seek out wise people and to belong to communities that are passionate about wisdom. Book learning has its place to be sure, but wisdom is best cultivated face to face. 
Now, many of us have been blessed to have wise parents, teachers, and colleagues, but even if we haven't been privileged in that way, there are opportunities in church life, in our adult forums, in Bible study, in spiritual direction, in book clubs, and in friendships of all kinds for growing in wisdom. Finally, and here is where the wisdom of Christ departs most dramatically from the wisdom of the philosophers, Christian wisdom, Ford writes, comes from the experience of opening ourselves up to others in selfless, empathetic care. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died in a concentration camp in solidarity with his Jewish brothers and sisters, wrote a piece near the end of his life entitled, The View from Below. In that essay, Bonhoeffer insists that real wisdom emerges only from experiencing the world from the vantage point of those others in this world who are at risk, and without power. We become truly wiser people by living with, caring for, and learning from our poor, our elderly, the sick, the disabled, all those who suffer. Which is why Jesus does what he does at the end of our gospel lesson today. When Jesus sees his obtuse disciples quarreling about who among them is the greatest, he responds by sitting them down and telling them what I told the children and what this lady at Crosby's told me, that whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then more importantly, it's what Jesus does, not what he says. He finds an innocent child takes her into his arms and says to all those gathered, to welcome God into your life is to welcome just such a precious child. Strangely, the wisdom of God is rooted not in exerting strength and power, but in caring for the vulnerable and the least among us. Perhaps we would have been better off if there had been more mothers among Jesus' first disciples. Such was the lesson, after all, of that most famous of stories about King Solomon's wisdom. I know you remember it. It's the one about the two women who come to the king, each claiming to be the mother of an infant child. They ask the king to settle their dispute and determine the real mother. Solomon declares that the only way to resolve the matter is to cut the baby in half. The one woman is satisfied with this result, content that if she can't have the baby, at least no one else will. The other woman wails against the ruling, begging Solomon, give the baby to her, but please just don't kill him, revealing herself to be the real mother. Now, we see wisdom, of course, in Solomon's clever ploy for ferreting out the true mother. But as the great theologian Karl Barth points out, it is the contrast in the women's behavior that reveals an even deeper truth about Christian wisdom. There are some people, Barth writes, who, like the first woman, profess to come to God in search of wisdom and would even inflict death upon another to be proven right. And there are others, like the second woman, who come to God in search of wisdom and would rather suffer themselves in order to protect and care for the other. The wisdom of Christ, it turns out, is not the dispassionate cleverness of a ruling king. The wisdom of Christ is the self-giving and passionate love of a mother who would do absolutely anything for her child.